everyone. It's, it's good to see some of you in the videos at the top. Right now we are going to hear from Dr. Charles Achoku, who was part of the wonderful Pathways Through STEM panel yesterday. Um, but today he's actually going to talk more about some of his work and incredible research. And so his talk is titled Satellite Enabled Environmental Research in West Africa. And I'll quickly introduce him with a little intro here. Let's see here. Uh, Dr. Charles Ichoku is a professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies within the College of Arts and Sciences at Howard University in Washington, D.C., USA. He is also the Distinguished Scientist of the NOAA Cooperative Science Center in Atmospheric Sciences and Meteorology, which is a 13-member academic consortium con constituted to diversify the student population trained in atmospheric and environmental sciences, meteorology, and other fields that are aligned with NOAA's mission enterprise. Prior to joining Howard University in the fall of 2018, he was a research physical scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, where he was involved in a variety of earth science research and related activities for 20 years from 1998 to 2018. Dr. Ichoku received his PhD in earth sciences from the Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, France, and his master's and bachelor's in um, degrees in remote sensing and surveying, respectively, from the University of Nigeria and Enugu campus. His scientific activities over the years have included developing and applying both experimental and remote sensing approaches to research into interdisciplinary earth sciences. He's actively involved in the development of innovative approaches for characterizing land atmosphere interaction processes, uh, analyzing the energetics and emissions of wildfires and biomass burning, evaluating atmospheric aerosol retrievals from satellite observations, and understanding the impacts of these phenomena on the environment and climate. Dr. Ichoku has trained and mentored a large number of undergraduate and graduate students, as well as postdocs and early career scientists and university faculty. He's also won several NASA individual and group achievement awards. He has co-authored, or he has authored and co-authored more than 80 papers in peer-reviewed scientific publications and has delivered multiple dozens of invited and keynote talks at a variety of international and national conferences and workshops and research seminars. So with that being said, um, welcome Dr. Charles Achoku and please go ahead and share your research. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Tashiana, for this very kind introduction. I am glad to be back here today. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Um, as I said before I started, I wanted to uh, kind of start with saying that since I, I know that this is a workshop about oceanography, but I'm not one. So this is about the, the slide you're looking at is about the only slide you will see showing a, a large body of water. So most of what I'll be talking about will be uh, research over land, but I know that the land and ocean and atmosphere are coupled um, in, you know, in the uh, global circulation patterns. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some of the work we've done uh, in the last decade across uh, the uh, sub-Saharan African region, but particularly focused on West Africa and Central Africa. Um, looking at uh, a number of phenomena uh, that affect uh, the uh, region. Um, so in this, uh, I just showed this uh, picture here. You can see the, the last hurricane, the one that just happened this way, Hurricane ECS, uh, here hovering over the, uh, uh, the Caribbean. So this picture was taken from the uh, NASA Worldview. If many of you know it, if you don't, it's easy to find. Just Google NASA Worldview. You can do, you can generate any uh, any kind of picture that you want for any region. Uh, so let's go on. Okay. So the outline of today's talk, uh, we'll talk about the the work, uh, the research I'm going to talk about will be focused on drought that happens 
in the northern part of the Southern African region. Uh, I'll look at how we conducted some interdisciplinary research in that region relating to uh, the uh, precipitation uh, trends and uh, variability and the possible effects of uh, the regional biomass burning uh, that happens in that region. Uh, there will be a little bit of focus on the Lake Chad Basin, uh, which has seen uh, quite significant uh, you know, depletion in its water content. And then we'll look at how we have engaged people in that region during this uh, research activity. Uh, first, I'll share and acknowledge uh, some of the team members that participated in the research that I'm going to be describing. Uh, they are from uh, various institutions across the United States and West Africa. Actually, um, uh, you will see that uh, some of these people you see here uh, from various institutions in the U.S. and Africa, some were visiting, some were participating, some we visited, and so on. And you can see a list of their names. I don't have time to go through all of them. So let's look at the drought in the northern sub-Saharan African region. Um, so my um, interest in studying this phenomenon uh, started when I saw this publication, uh, which came out in 2002, uh, showing uh, the band, the band of rainfall across this region, West Africa and uh, East Africa across this region. And you'll see that it was a very, very broad band of rainfall in the pre-industrial period. But in the 1980s, uh, we see that the band had significantly narrowed. And they, one of the captions uh, there in this publication showed that um, we, you know, the scientists were uh, looking at why this is happening. And the worst periods of uh, the 1970s, 70, 72 to 75, and the 80s, that up to 1 million people starved to death in this region. So this caught my attention, and I thought, OK, here I am at NASA with all of these uh, resources to conduct research. I'm going to try to contribute to this uh, issue and try to figure out what's responsible for it. So um, this is a, a publication, another publication I saw, uh, where uh, observations of temperatures over time shows that the temperatures is, temperature is rising globally from the 1950s to uh, the 2000s. That's when the, this data was compiled. It's been rising. This is the trend. So, so if you look at the color scale, it's practically uh, rising everywhere from the 1950s. Uh, even up to the present. So now the lower uh, slide is for rainfall precipitation. You will see in some places it has been uh, increasing, in other places it's been decreasing. So if we look at this region that we are interested in, West Africa and East and Central Africa, you will see that for the most part in West Africa, precipitation has been decreasing over uh, the long term. So remember, this uh, period is from 1950 to 2008. So I looked again at another uh, data generated for 2009, just one year after this period, just to see what, what the trend had continued. And what I saw will not surprise you. Yes, uh, so this is a vegetation index. You will see that there has been um, you know, drying of vegetation in that region, even during the rainy season. This is for June of 20 of 2009. So some of the suggested causes of the drought in Northern Sub-Saharan Africa, one of the earlier publications by Charney uh, from MIT in 1975, indicated that overgrazing may be responsible for the drought in the Sahel, you know, around the Sahel region of Africa. And they, there were other studies. Um, so some studies uh, attributed the drying to uh, El Nino southern oscillation, uh, which is related to sea surface temperature, of course. Uh, these are several uh, studies that uh, reflected that um, thought. And um, other studies yet uh, were attributing it to sulfur, industrial sulfur emissions. Um, you know, from developed countries. Uh, you will see a number of publications uh, shown here. 
And uh, yet more studies were saying that this could be attributed to uh, volcanic eruptions in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, you'll see some of the uh, publications. But up to that time, up to the time I was looking, uh, not too many studies were looking at this. What are these? Uh, this is an image I uh, just observed in one day, uh, one overpass basically, from the um, um, NPP VIRS instrument satellite overpasses in uh, January of 2016. All of the red dots you see here represent fire detections from this uh, satellite sensor. So a lot of burning goes on here in the dry season. Uh, you will see that, um, so the burning while the fires are here, you will see some uh, dust emissions from the Bordelais depression here in the Lake Chad Basin. So this dust is combined with the smoke emitted from these fires. Uh, if I had not included uh, this, the boundary, the, uh, the continental boundary, you will not see the, um, the difference between the land and ocean here because of the thickness of the um, uh, atmospheric aerosols uh, due to the combination of dust and smoke. So this is really significant and uh, these have implications. Uh, the atmospheric composition has implications for what's going on regarding uh, rainfall and so on and so forth. You can even see that it seemed like uh, the uh, aerosols is holding the clouds at bay here, which means that the clouds cannot come uh, onto land to uh, produce precipitation. Anyway, so this is a sort of an annual cycle of uh, burning in that whole region. You will see that in uh, January, February, up to March, there's a lot of burning in that region, in the West and Central African region. And then the burning starts decreasing and they're heading south as the rainy season, uh, season is advancing to this region. So the burning heads south. And then it continues until the dry season is coming back up and the burning is leaving the south and the south becomes the rainy season. And then the dry season is coming here and the burning comes back up here. Um, if you look at the precipitation map, a similar precipitation map, you see that it's the opposite. So during the dry season, there is no rain here. There is rainfall in the south and so on and so forth. And in the rainy season around the summertime, um, July, August, and so on. The rain comes back here, and so on. So there is some kind of exchange, uh, uh, you know, special exchange of the distribution of rainfall and burning in this region. So far, we're just looking at the patterns, the uh, temporal patterns, nothing about their relationship. So let's look uh, briefly at uh, this uh, poster child of the Sahel drought. This is uh, Lake Chad. Um, I hope that many of you know where, the, where it is located. It's actually very, very central on the continent of Africa. So in the 60s, it was full of water. So as time went on, uh, if you recall that um, the first uh, slide I showed about the rain ban, you will see that it started losing its water. Even up till now, um, it's not full. It's uh, very, it's, it, it decreased to about 10% or 5% of what it used to be in the early 60s. So even uh, lately, as lately as uh, the uh, 2008 when this image was acquired, you will see that uh, this is Lake Chad here. This is the dust emission uh, from the bodily depression. You will still see during the dry season that there is still a lot of burning in the vegetation left here. Whereas here, this region, which has already had its vegetation very significantly depleted, uh, becomes a new dust source. So, um, and uh, I was there in, in 2015, where, where I, when I took this picture here, that you see here in the Lake Chad Basin around here near N'Djamena. And so uh, my uh, uh, deduction is that with more fires, you produce more bare soil like you see here. And this bare soil becomes a new uh, emission of dust source. And once it becomes a dust source, uh, well, you are creating desertification. So um, uh, that's the thing. So let's see how we approach the study. So we asked a number of uh, relevant science questions. Uh, so the, you saw the people I showed in the picture originally. So I called a few people and say, let's uh, submit a proposal to uh, study this phenomenon uh, going on there. What is the relationship between the burning and 
the, uh, the lack of rainfall. So we looked at it from different perspectives. So the first is the energy cycle. Uh, then we looked at the water cycle. We looked at the interactions and feedbacks. And then we looked at climate and society. So we asked questions that are relevant, uh, which I'm not going to be reading uh, here, but it's all here. So then uh, we designed this um, connection uh, so as to establish some kind of uh, uh, hypothesis of how we think that burning on the ground is related to precipitation. But remember that um, they do not happen as far as uh, in Africa, um, northern or southern Africa, they don't happen during the same season. They happen at different seasons. But these uh, different processes take place. So when you burn, you remove vegetation cover and that changes the surface albedo, which is relevant for radiation. And uh, so it uh, has an impact on the radiative forcing. At the same time you're burning, you're emitting some uh, aerosol, that is some particles and some gases, CO2, CO, and so on, which also have some influence on interaction of radiation and the atmosphere. And so we together produce the atmospheric heating, which affects the atmospheric circulation. At the same time, heat flux is emitted directly from the burning, which also affects uh, the atmospheric circulation. And uh, this also impacts the human society. But remember that it is in that region, it is people that light the fire. So the people introduce the fire, and then the fire produces all of these things. But at the same time, the fire also affects the vegetation dynamics, uh, which, um, you know, which is ultimately impacted by precipitation and so on and so forth. So we don't have to spend time and analyze this figure. All of what I'm showing, and I have to mention this, that at the bottom of each of my slides, I put the, uh, the citation, the publication where what I'm showing has been published. So if you look at this uh, publication, you will find this figure and you can get uh, the full explanation of what we are trying to explain here. Um, so uh, we looked at how are we going to address this research. So the phenomena uh, that happen in that region um, uh, have different scales, uh, the local scale, the regional scale, and the global scale, uh, but also a temporal scale. So at the local scale, uh, the processes take uh, periods of hours to days to occur. Um, and the example of the uh, processes is like the cloud feedback. So at the uh, regional scale, it can take uh, like months or weeks to months and season. But at the global scale, uh, which is related to ocean circulation, uh, it can take seasons to decades. Okay, so we are thinking about how are we going to address uh, this issue. In terms of uh, the area of study, we decided to focus our study on that region. If you remember that region where we saw uh, the rainfall uh, decreasing significantly, but also to uh, put our focus specifically on Lake Chad. So this is LCD, the Lake Chad Basin. So we decided to select uh, what kind of approach we're going to adopt and what kind of data sets we needed to analyze to address this question that we're examining. So the approach, uh, remember we divided the study into energy cycle, water cycle, inter and so on and so forth. So we identified the data sets that we were going to analyze. These are mostly satellite data, but also model uh, output and some assimilated uh, output, uh, you know, of satellite and other observations uh, from models. So for the water cycle, we're going to look at the precipitation, soil moisture, and so on and so forth, vegetation, greenness, evapotranspiration, and so on. Uh, you see all of them here. So uh, let's see uh, how we uh, looked at the, uh, the how we uh, embarked on the study. So this example here is the anomaly of rainfall over a long period of time from the early 1900s to uh, the present, mainly this, I think this is, this went up to 20, uh, 2008 or so. So you will notice that, um, so rainfall has been going down and increasing and going down and increasing as well. So, but the level of Lake Chad has been following, um, you know, tracking the rainfall changes. That's something that we, we notice here. 
And this, uh, you can see it uh, at the Earth Observatory uh, website where we put this plot. So what is responsible for these changes of rainfall? Because uh, to understand, um, you know, we look, we've looked at the, uh, the lake level is following the rainfall uh, um, a trend, but what is responsible? So we looked at two major um, um, uh, uh, issues, two major uh, uh, phenomena. That is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation and the ENSO. So, uh, and they each have a positive phase and negative phase. So basically, uh, we see that um, there is uh, increase in rainfall during the positive phase of both, or even during the positive phase of the uh, Atlantic motor decadal oscillation. And uh, during the negative phase, uh, there is no uh, change. So, um, so, but when we, you know, we plotted it here, the same plot you saw in the previous, this one here, this plot here. So when, when put together here on the same axis, and at the same time, we plot the, uh, the AMO and ENSO, we see how they are correlated, you see? So uh, this is the rainfall, the purple is the rainfall changes. Uh, blue is the uh, AMO, red is the ENSO, and then at the lake level is in green. Uh, we notice that there are different uh, stages where they change, where they correlate. But one thing we see here clearly is that during the uh, 70s, uh, mid 70s to mid 80s, we saw a very dramatic uh, decrease. And during that dramatic decrease, it was when uh, they were both in their negative phases. So this was uh, decreased significantly. So the summary of what we're showing here is that the late 60s and early 70s marked a turning point in the uh, precipitation pattern in that region. You know, that was when the severe droughts uh, happened in that region up to the uh, mid 80s and a lot of people died. So, uh, but after this dramatic uh, downturn in the precipitation, there was a little bit of recovery, but this recovery did not, uh, has not reached the level, the average level expected for uh, the rain to come back. That's why the lake has remained almost dry to this day. Um, we've looked at some data sets uh, you know, we utilized a hierarchical clustering approach to a look at a rainfall data uh, uh, in Africa to see how they change, whether the, how the change occurs naturally. And what you see here, so uh, these uh, curves are color coded relative to uh, what you see here. So I have plotted only three of them. This, uh, you know, sub-Saharan Northern Africa, and this uh, humid uh, coastal Africa and um, Southern Africa. You'll see that in Southern Africa, the trend is flat. It's neither decreasing nor increasing over a long period of time. Of course, there is a lot of uh, wiggles. You know, sometimes there is a severe drought, which is a short-lived, and sometimes there's very heavy rain, uh, which is also short-lived. But overall, for the entire period of in 1950s, uh, 1940s to the present, um, you will see that the trend in Southern Africa has remained steady. But the, in coastal West Africa, as you see here where we are now, you will see that there is very significant decrease in rainfall over time, and it has continued over time. So that's something to be concerned about for the future. And this includes the Congo Basin, okay? So we know now that the Congo Basin has a lot of water, but we don't know what can happen in the, uh, in the distant future. Uh, also here in the Sahel uh, uh, um, uh, semi-arid region, it's also decreasing. So that's con a concern. So this is temperature. The same uh, analysis uh, we carried out using uh, temperature. We see that everywhere throughout Africa, temperature is increasing. And that's not a surprise because you remember during the um, uh, during our panel uh, yesterday, George kept saying 
global warming, it's no joke, it's happening. Yes, it is happening, it's happening, it's warming, it's increasing everywhere in Africa. So um, let's get back to, uh, remember I said, uh, when we wanted to start this study, we were thinking, okay, so who is looking at the effect of biomass burning all of these fires? So we decided to conduct the study of looking at the fires. So uh, first, let's look at the albedo. Uh, what is albedo? Albedo is the brightness of the surface, and that has an impact um, um, on radiative forcing, uh, global radiative forcing, that affects uh, the temperature changes and uh, you know, also indirectly uh, changes in precipitation. So, um, so um, we looked at this uh, albedo. Uh, so let's look at what, what we did here. So we tracked some locations, some specific fires we saw from satellite, some specific regions. Uh, so let's say we looked at the different types of land cover. If you look at this map, it's different land cover types uh, based on uh, MODIS land cover classification. Uh, MODIS, by the way, is a sensor, satellite sensor that has become very famous because a lot of people, it's a global data set that a lot of people use for um, uh, various kinds of studies, both over land and ocean. So what you see here is that for, we tracked what happens with, um, uh, what happens with, um, uh, you know, the same cropland type, one that has been affected by fire and a point that has not been affected by fire. So when you look there, uh, two different points, they are very, very uh, similar until fire happens in the one that has been affected by fire. When that happens, the albedo is lower, okay? So the other one continues. But after a certain period of time, they rejoin and continue. So which means that the fire it burns the area, it becomes darker, and after a while, the vegetation starts growing again, and then it goes back to what it is. So this is the natural cycle based on the dryness and the wetness, the seasonal cycle of vegetation, uh, albedo. So we uh, did this study for various land cover types, and we see that the effect of uh, burning on all land cover types on the albedo is negative, okay, except for uh, cropland. Um, why is it? Uh, we're going to learn that. Uh, so this is a picture again that I took uh, when I went to uh, the Lake Chad Basin in 2015. You will see what actually happened. So uh, this is a land, so which is uh, this uh, brightness, and when the vegetation is burned, it becomes darker. So this is what happens actually. So we try to see how does that uh, overall is there a recovery? You know, when it's, uh, there is burning and it becomes darker, is there a recovery from that? Yes, we saw overall throughout this region, it takes about six years uh, for an entire region that has been affected by fire to recover completely and continue to produce vegetation the way that uh, it would have if it had not burned. Okay, so something else we looked at is how does this uh, burning uh, and the vegetation changes that happen, uh, how do they, uh, you know, what kinds of vegetation change? What kind of land cover type change to other land cover types? So we found that uh, for the most part, um, many of the land cover types in this region are converted from what they used to be like savanna and grassland, they are converted to cropland. That's what we saw. So here overall, um, these are the changes. These reflect the changes that happen over time. This is savanna to cropland changes. This is forest to cropland. So uh, much of the savanna in that region changes over time to cropland. Much of the uh, forest uh, changes to cropland also. And we uh, quantified it uh, in this publication that uh, the change is of the order of 0.18% uh, 0.28% of the entire land in West and Central Africa change is converted from other types of vegetation to cropland. And out of that 
a 0.18% is from savanna alone. So many of the uh, land types, including wetlands, are converted to cropland. That's what we saw there. Now we looked at the emissions. So what did we do? Uh, during this study, we uh, decided to uh, develop uh, what kinds of uh, smoke emissions are generated from these fires. Uh, but we did not focus that uh, in Africa. We did a global study of emissions from fires. So uh, I will not spend the time to explain all of this, but basically we see uh, the fire from satellite, we see the smoke from satellite, and then we uh, use uh, data from wind and so on and determine the rate of emission of smoke particles and also we quantify the rate of release of heat energy from the fire. And when we plot here, we see there's a very good correlation. Uh, of course, um, we utilize that relationship to quantify uh, globally this uh, a correlation, uh, which actually we call the uh, uh, emission coefficient of uh, the, the fires and smoke. So these are the different uh, uh, different values of emission coefficients from the different fires globally. Uh, so we were able to quantify that. And when we did this, uh, this is related to the rate of release of fire radiative uh, energy, which is fire radiative power and rate of emission of smoke particles. So it was the first, and it still is, the first gridded emission factor product uh, globally amongst the emissions products. And the first to require only direct uh, satellite measurement to calculate emissions. And um, it is a truly real time. It allows you to quantify emission rates in real time. So this uh, plot here is the um, quality uh, flags for the values we computed here. So which means that these values here have very high quality. Uh, in the other regions, the quality is lower. Um, so basically what, we, what we're showing here is that um, this is the emission coefficient. We did it in such a way that uh, you can observe the fire radiative energy from satellite, and all you need to do is to multiply it with the emission coefficient we derived in order to get the total emissions of particles and so on. So uh, this is just to illustrate what we did. And uh, this data is available here. It is still available at this uh, website here, and a lot of people are using it in their various studies currently. So we use this data to study how uh, smoke contributes to the atmospheric circulation in our study region. Uh, you will see here, this is the observation of uh, satellite observation uh, modes, as you see here, of the fires. Uh, you will see the red dots here. And this is the total column aerosol optical thickness also from the same satellite. But then uh, we put it in a a uh, mesoscale model, the Worfkin model, some of you may know this model uh, that does uh, atmospheric, uh, uh, atmospheric modeling. And we were able to see how dust and smoke are mixing. Dust plus smoke, this is dust, this is smoke. So we also uh, compared not only the horizontal distribution of these emissions from the fires, but also the vertical distribution. Uh, there is a, uh, also another satellite, uh, Calypso satellite, which carries an instrument, a LIDAR instrument, Calliope, that looks at, uh, draws a curtain along its track, and it's able to see uh, different uh, distributions of atmospheric uh, composition. For instance, in this case, uh, you will see uh, clouds here, cirrus clouds but also you will see uh, near here, you will see smoke and uh, dust and other things like that. So basically uh, we were able to uh, put, so this is the model, this is say from WorfCam, uh, what we generate from WorfCam, and this is what uh, is generated from the Calypso satellite. And the comparison shows that, yes, uh, it, it, you know, the general average uh, injection height that uh, matches uh, very well uh, WorfCam simulations is about 650 meters from the ground up. So when you uh, burn in those fires, those small fires that you burn, agricultural fires, it's emitting smoke that goes up uh, on average to about 650 meters, but also can go much higher. 
uh, actually some smoke have been detected about six kilometers uh, above West Africa. So um, still remember that we are still trying to see how is the burning related to uh, the rainfall, to the water in that region. Um, so to, to enable us to study that in some detail, we divided the region uh, in some, you will see some uh, boxes here on the left uh, slide. And uh, the, the background image is the uh, land cover type. You will see the different land cover types here. So we decided to correlate this, the burning in this region with uh, the different water cycle indicators, uh, precipitation, soil moisture, NDVI, which is the normalized difference vegetation index, which is the vegetation greenness, essentially, and evapotranspiration. So you'll notice that we uh, named this, uh, these boxes are Northwest, North, Central, Northeast, Midwest, Mid-Central, Mid-East, South, Central, Southeast. So that, that's the designation of all these uh, different boxes. Um, so they are represented here. So we try to see how is the burning correlated with these different water cycle indicators uh, for the whole year. And we see that uh, if you compare the correlation for the whole year for the period of uh, data analysis, you will see that um, burning is negatively correlated always throughout the year along these three northern um, uh, regions, okay, that we see here. So along the Sahel, burning is negatively correlated with, with precipitate, with uh, water cycle, whatever water cycle indicators we are trying to examine. Now, we looked at the uh, actual uh, burning season, the dry season, to see how is it correlated? How do, how do they correlate with one another? We see that this region here, this one, you see here, Midwest, that is West Africa, okay? We see during the dry season, there is still some residual rainfall that happens here because this is uh, the humid part of West Africa. We'll notice that during the burning season, uh, during the dry season, uh, this is a, a very strong negative correlation between burning and, and, uh, and the water cycle indicators. So that's what we see here. And of course, it also happens in all of the other uh, more humid parts of the whole region. Um, something else we looked at is, okay, so what is the threshold uh, of burning and um, dry season and wet season? We see this plot where we look at the uh, fire radiative energy flux, which is, which is an expression of the rate of energy release from burning. And uh, this is the rate of precipitation, the daily precipitation. Uh, basically, we see that during the dry season, uh, there's a negative correlation. Uh, during the rainy season, uh, there is no burning. And the threshold between the rainy and dry season is around four millimeters of rainfall. And, um, but then we see that the transition period for that region, for that West African, humid West African region is April. That's when it changes from dry season to rainy season. Uh, during that time, there is some kind of positive correlation going on. So, uh, which tends to suggest that uh, something is happening with uh, rainfall and burning correlating, but it's not clear uh, what that correlation is. We needed to do more study to understand uh, whether uh, the burning during that period is enhancing uh, precipitation or whether it's just a mere coincidence. Um, so, um, so let's go to uh, some form of attempt to project the future. So we also did that. We tried to study what happens um, in, the, in the future at the, toward the end of the current century. Uh, first of all, we looked at the baseline of uh, precipitation throughout Africa. As you see here on the left map, you will see the millimeters of rainfall per year for the different regions. Uh, you will see an example. This is Lake Chad right here, if you see my cursor. And the average rainfall uh, per year in Lake Chad is around uh, three, uh, 300 millimeters of rainfall. 
So now this is the rainfall change expected uh, from now to the end of this century, 2021. Uh, 20, yeah. Um, uh, yes, 2021. Sorry, it's not that. It's 2100. Okay. Um, so we see that, yes, along the coastal regions of Africa, we expect to see less precipitation. So precipitation will keep decreasing. It is expected based on some projections that precipitation will increase here. But be careful, this increase is almost not significant because if you look at Lake Chad, for instance, uh, where the rainfall is currently 300, if there is an increase of 30 millimeters of rainfall, it's practically insignificant. It's 10% uh, of increase, which is not much. So, so some people may see this map and say, oh, we're going to see an increased uh, precipitation in Central and East Africa. But that rate of increase is not uh, what you expect it to be. Um, so we, we conducted a study uh, specifically to look at the Lake Chad Basin. Um, so why? Because the water has been disappearing. As you see, what I showed before in the 70s, uh, it was already depleted, but not very much. Uh, presently, this is around uh, 2010. I think this last image is 2010. You will see that it's still the way it has been since the um, late 70s. So there has not been an increase in, in the water. So we're looking at, okay, so let's look at, there are some advantages to the situation of Lake Chad and some disadvantages. Uh, let's start with the advantage. The advantage is it's an endorheic basin where uh, there is no outflow of water to the ocean. All of the water that fall in this basin stays in this basin. So that's an advantage because these are mountains all surrounding it. This is the basin. Now the disadvantage is that most of the basin that is the catchment for the Lake Chad is dry, doesn't receive much rain. Only this port, this uh, southern port of this uh, basin uh, collects the water. So most of the water, 95% of the water that feeds Lake Chad comes from this uh, small part of the basin. So that's the advantage to know. Uh, but so we conducted, we were looking to study, uh, use the satellite data, but also uh, use some ground-based measurements for validation. We couldn't find uh, much ground-based measurements, so we decided to go to the field and uh, install um, uh, instruments to collect uh, some uh, relevant data for our study. So we went there in uh, 2015 to install um, I know that time is running, but uh, I'll just hurry and finish. So we went there and installed uh, some instruments. And these are the reasons why we went there to study. So these are the examples of the instruments we installed. A weather, automated weather station that uh, sends the data uh, automatically uh, using cell phone technology. We still collect the data up to, to, to this day. And they, uh, um, a soil moisture probe and the groundwater meters. So that was a very big event at the time we went there to install. Actually, our first installation was the very first um, automated weather station to be installed in Central Africa. So we had the TV crew come to interview us. Uh, this is me here uh, during that uh, process. So we installed just a few of them. And uh, subsequently, we used satellite data to look at uh, the changes in the lake's water. Uh, these are publications by others of what had been done before uh, the changes in the lake chat. So basically what we did was to look at, to compare two methods of deriving uh, water, uh, you know, surface water uh, in Lake Chad uh, from two different uh, instruments. Uh, this is a MODIS land surface temperature method and the Sentinel radar uh, method from Europe. So we see basically that they compare fairly well, the two methods compare fairly well, and this is published here. So um, in any case, throughout this work, we were engaged with some organizations on the ground. This is uh, an example, Waskal. You will notice that we visited Waskal at that time to discuss uh, some of what we're doing and how that's applicable to uh, some of their research activities and how we could collaborate. So we, we, we were engaged with them. 
and they, uh, some of their uh, scientists uh, visited uh, us at uh, NASA when I was there, if you recall. So this is uh, an example of when they visited. And then uh, in 2017, I conducted a, a capacity building workshop in Kumasi. And uh, people attended from uh, about nine countries of uh, West Africa. And these were the uh, lecturers I invited from uh, uh, the US, uh, Europe, and, uh, and West Africa. And so this is a picture of when the lectured uh, uh, senior office officials visited us there, these two, uh, and this is the director at the time. So we're discussing a number of things, how to work together. So we showed them what we already did during the installation. So we discussed the next steps. Um, in any case, um, in uh, two years ago, there was a conference to save Lake Chad. Uh, as you may know, you may not know, um, they are trying to, one of the main uh, proposals on the table is to try to pull some water from the Ubangi River and pull that water to uh, replenish Lake Chad. So there was this conference in Abuja uh, two years ago where there were six heads of state there and we were on the stage on the panel trying to brief them on the discussions and our scientific findings and so on. So I was really uh, surprised to see six presidents in front of me. I've never been in front of a president of a country, but here I see six of them. I took out my camera and I took this picture. So um, that was what happened. So this is the list of the publications um, uh, related to this study. These are other references mentioned in this uh, discussion. And uh, these are the uh, acknowledgments. Uh, the study was funded by NASA under the Interdisciplinary Studies Program. And there were other uh, organizations we interacted with that I acknowledge here. Thank you. Let me stop here now and take questions. Sorry that it took so long. Thank you so much for that, Charles. Um, it was really wonderful to hear more about some of your work and all of the efforts that you're involved in that are seeming to be pretty collaborative. And so I do see that we have some questions in the chat box and maybe, uh, Lila, I saw you were on a little bit earlier. Do you want to just ask these directly? Are you there, Lila? Well, just to start, she first asked, how does burning affect the water cycle? Further details on trends, hold and transition, biomass burning in dry and wet season. Yes, there are various ways that biomass burning can affect uh, precipitation. In places where they occur concurrently, uh, depending on the conditions of the atmosphere, the smoke can interact with clouds and either suppress or enhance uh, precipitation where they occur at the same time. Um, in places like uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, either the Western and uh, Central Africa axis or the Southern Africa, what could happen is the uh, Cumulative impacts of burning can affect the surface albedo and the precipitation and water retention and soil moisture, which can eventually, because soil moisture is coupled with precipitation sometimes. So where there is water on the ground, the rainfall, will there will be more rainfall. When it is totally dry, there is no rainfall. If you look at the Sahara, there is zero rainfall there. So uh, because of the dryness, extreme dryness, that can happen even before the rainy season sets in. It can affect, uh, it can, it can uh, affect the, the potential for rain to happen there and also affect the amount of rain that actually happens there. Other things that can happen is that you may be burning in West and Central Africa and it could be affecting the rainfall in Southern Africa and vice versa because they, uh, they, the seasons and they, the burning season and the rainfall season is swapped between the two regions. So one, because the smoke is not static, it moves and goes to uh, the other part while it's, the burning is happening in one part of uh, one region of Africa. So there are many things, but uh, studies 
need to continue to really unravel some of these uh, 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 issues that we have not uh, completely unraveled so far. Thanks for that. We have someone who's raising their hand and would like to speak. Um, Osas, would you like to unmute? Yeah. And if you want to share your uh, your uh, video, please feel free. Okay. Um, good evening. Good afternoon. Thank you, Prof, for the enlightenment and the information. But there, there's a question I want to ask. When I was in um, in Baga in 1990, we visited the uh, Lake Chad, and the water, like you said, has reduced now compared to then. My question is, there, there used to be a very strong wild wind then. And it blows, it, it could remove roofs, it could destroy so many things. And so my question is, what is the impact of that wild wind on the water? Um, so the wind continues, it, it happens every year. So if you saw one of my uh, slides, uh, it goes, there's a, an area there called the Bordelli Depression. That's the largest uh, dust bowl in the world. So the wind can lift the dust and uh, you know, some of the heavier particles can be deposited back into the lake chat. So by so doing, uh, the, the, you know, the dust will absorb the water. Uh, and, um, and also some of the water can be airlifted while the wind is blowing, the same way that a wind can lift water uh, from the ocean and uh, you know, take the water to the atmosphere and they produce clouds which now lead to rainfall. So that's possible. But you see that the, the wind comes from uh, east of the Lake Chad, northeast of the Lake Chad, and can take some of the water and they uh, take it away because there's not enough um, saturation for a cloud to be produced and for rain to fall during that dry season. Then the water goes away. So that's, uh, and, uh, and we've also observed during our study that there is significant evaporation of the lake just because of the temperature, not only because of the wind, but because of the temperature in that region. So all of these phenomena are connected and continue to lead to uh, the drought situation in that region. Okay, sir. Is there, is there any way it can be curbed or prevented? Because no, you cannot, you cannot prevent the wind. You can, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, plant new vegetation. You can plant new, uh, 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 you know, vegetation in that region. But the more vegetation you have in a region, the more uh, capability the land to retain water, because then the water, the, 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 the vegetation and its, uh, you know, its uh, leaves and branches will obstruct the intense heat from the sun that uh, allows the land to lose its water. So the solution is to reforest, to continue to plant. And I think that some people did that uh, along the Sahel some time ago. Um, I don't know, I've not followed that uh, effort to see where it stands today, but that's one of the ways the people who live in that region need to uh, be very aggressive about uh, replanting vegetation and, and reducing burning, you know, uh, find other ways of doing their farm practices rather than just setting fire. Because setting fire, you can imagine vegetation that took several years to grow, you set the fire, it can destroy it in a couple of minutes. So uh, these are ways to, uh, that people can do something to help. Um, uh, mitigate the situation. Okay, thank you, Prof. Sure. Thanks for that question, Osas. We also now have a thesis. So if you would like to ask your question, I saw it in the chat box. I didn't forget about you. We just have some people raising their hands also. So Asish, would you like to go ahead? I saw you a bit ago. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much, the moderators and the Professor Charles Ichoku. Uh, I pick in interest on your program based on the program I listened to yesterday. 
and uh, uh, my most important thing uh, is that I, I discovered that there is issue of the stratification going on in the, in the country, most especially in Nigeria, where I hear from, from the northern part of the countries. And the issue from the lecture is affecting the country massively. The water, I think, has been reduced. The water content from the lecture has been reduced by, it, by, by 30 to 40 percent. 95 percent. 95 percent from the 1960s. Good, 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 sir. Then secondly, we have also observed that the issue of urbanization and industrialization is now causing the issue of desertifications. People are cutting trees for economic purpose, furnishings, industrialization, clothing, and whatever. Nobody is building on replacement. So this is a great concern. And we are talking about SDG go thing, climate actions. The Africa as a continent is not doing enough here. There's not enough support in this axis. In 2019, I was in Singapore. I attended a program on environmental conservation and sustainability. And I saw what they have invested massively in the area of vegetation and climate controls. How do we go about that in, in Africa? If, we, if our leaders are interested, the, the reality on purpose is that the fund is not even there in Africa. So why I'm bringing you this question is that I've seen so many things having go to one or two countries for fellowship program funded by those countries. But in Africa, in my organization, for example, I'm sitting in the office, for example, we have a project in my organization called afforestation, where we plant trees every year. But to sustain these trees, the fund is not there, either from the, from the government. So my issue is that, is there a way we can assess some grants? Is there a way we can do more for Africans? Because what we are seeing present in Africa is that we focus the West, we focus the Asians, and the, but the issue we are having in Africa, don't forget, if you continue this way, the, 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 the lectures will dry up. It's already affecting the lot of, in another part of the country. So how can you help? How can Africa be resuscitated to what we used to hear in the past? This is my question. Yes, so there are many different, um, you know, different uh, activity in that direction. But it's a situation, I think somebody said, all hands have to be on deck to really make things happen. Uh, many uh, donors from other international donors like the World Bank and uh, the yeah. United Nations are attentive to the situation in, in northern Africa, in, in the northern sub-Saharan Africa, like where you're describing uh, the Sahel region. Sure. Um, currently, uh, we are I'm involved in a, in a white paper um, uh, coordinated from the UN. Uh, on Lake Chad, specifically on Lake Chad, how do you uh, deal with that? But I don't think that um, African, uh, West African countries should always be looking for the outside donors to help. This thing, you know, you, you are working for the government of a, one of the countries of West Africa. Um, that country is not a poor country. So that country should be able to sustain what you're doing, the afforestation, to the level that they can possibly do it and continue to do it. And then while doing it, they can then show the World Bank, look, we are doing this, but we don't have enough money to continue. Can you help? And so they will see what you're already doing. For, for someone to help, they need to see action already happening. And they need to see that that action is sustained and they, you know, really being uh, done uh, consistently and uh, you know uh, with with a, with a goal in mind. So so that's all I can say. Um, there are many different organizations in the world paying attention to what's going on, and they are actively trying to see what can happen. But they need the structure on the ground in that region. So when you said you went to um, Singapore and you saw their afforestation program, you were impressed by that. Who was funding that? Was it the government of Singapore or the United Nations? I don't know. If it's the government of Singapore, in the same way, the West African organization can come together and decide to do something about this very serious issue of desertification. And you may, you may, you may know that some of the 
influx of the people coming from the north toward the south to do things, maybe because of lack of water around the Lake Chad where they used to occupy. So now they have to migrate and that can cause some uh, you know, conflicts and, and things in the other parts of the, of the region. So that's, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, there is no, uh, there's no silver bullet. There is no easy way out. There, nobody can say, here is money, take the money and go and do this. So the country just needs to be doing what they are doing and coordinate because this is a regional problem. It's not a country by country problem. There is ECOWAS, there are other organizations. I mentioned WASCA. These are region, uh, region wide organizations that can come together and discuss these issues and start dealing with them. And they are doing that already, but they need to coordinate a little bit more and then attract more funding from outside of, uh, outside of the region. Oh, you're muted. Can you unmute? It's a follow-up question. And just maybe, so actually before you, before you on you, um, Charles, so we're right at this, this ending mark, but are you willing to, or available to stay on for two more questions? It's okay if not, but just let yeah, us know. Okay, what okay, okay sure. I can, I can do for 15 more minutes. Sure. Okay. Okay. 15 more minutes. So maybe we'll, we'll take the next two questions and see how long those take. Um, so let's go to Eben because he's been raising his hand. So go ahead, please. Good morning, and thanks, Pro, for the very insightful talk and to learn a lot about what is happening in your region. My question is um, you mentioned the, and you show a slide on the AMO and then the ENSO, and we see that sometimes they track each other quite nicely, and then there are also some periods where you see that they sort of a bit like inversely related. So what I wanted to ask is in your results or in the analysis you do or you did, did you see any um, impact, say individually, say if you were to um, do a partial correlation between the AMO and the ENSO to see the relative impact of each? Because I'm sure there will be some years that the AMO um, occurred on its own and there may be other years that it co-occurred with ENSO, for example. So is there like, and then anything in the result, we show that when you have ENSO co-occurring with AMO, it tends to magnify the impact that they, these um, climate events have on the environments that you're looking at. Yes, so <laughs> what we found from our study is that the AMO is more influential. So when it's in its positive phase, um, that tends to increase precipitation. Uh, when you add ENSO, positive and so that increases it a little bit more. But negative AMO guarantees no water. Okay, so, so we found that they are, they are both influential, but the AMO is more influential than, than ENSO. Oh, okay, thanks. And what, what is AMO? Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation. Okay. It, it has to do with sea surface temperature, just like ENSO. Uh, the, 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 the changing uh, patterns of sea surface temperature. Uh, the Atlantic has its own ENSO. That's correct. And That's called the AMO, yes. Oh, is that? Okay. And yes. does that affect the Chad rainfall? Yes, it does. Well, uh, based on our study, you know, we can only base it on the data that we analyzed, yes. We saw the, we saw the signal there. So just a follow on was there um, in there, there seems to be a regime, a regime change when you show that profile. I mean, towards the recent decades, there, there's some sort of regime change. What, what was the key factor that um, caused this? Um, so um, let me see where you're talking about. I'll go and share my uh, slides again and see. <clears throat> Uh, I hope you see it now. Yes, sir. I'm seeing it. Okay. Okay. Is it here? Um, the, so well, you're talking yeah. about this change here, right? Yes, yes sir. Yeah, there seems to be a regime change. A regime yeah, change. so you, yeah. you will see that uh, at this time, 
um, both uh, the AMO and the ENSO were in their negative phases. Mm -hmm. They coincided. So because of the double negative, I think the, uh, the precipitation went down very significantly. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so that's the, you know that's one of the things we saw, but of course there are other factors. But these were the two main um, uh, general circulation, uh, you know, sea surface temperature uh, uh, indices that we examined. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And so we had. Um, oh, sorry, the screen just changed here. So, thanks for sharing that, Charles. Uh, going going back to your slide. So we also have. Joseph, um, here, Joseph Quasi. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pro, for the wonderful presentation. This is actually not my fault, but I've learned a lot today. Uh, I'm calling from Ghana and uh, specifically Takwa. I have um, two questions, please. I remember 10 years ago when I came to Takwa, we always have rainfall, uh, be it the dry season or the rainy season. And we have a nickname called Takwa at 2 because basically every 2 p.m. or 14 hours GMT, there is um, rain coming down. But um, over the last three years till now, there has been a drastic change uh, in that pattern. Um, sometimes even in the rainy seasons, we don't experience much rainfall. This year in particular, too, we, we are experiencing quite a similar thing. The, the rainfall pattern has reduced drastically. And I want to ask, um, could it also be uh, sometimes the, 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 the nature of the terrain? Because I realize that currently there has been massive um, development or urbanization where a lot of hills are being cut down to a level ground so that people can develop their plots and all kind of things. Could that also be a factor? That's number one. Then question number two. Does pollution of the water bodies around us also affect the rate of precipitation? Because we realize that due to the illegal mining activities, most of our water bodies around us are, are heavily polluted and the color is now brownish in nature. Could that also be a factor? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, so there are many things that happen in, in atmospheric circulation and the atmospheric processes. There is uh, local micrometeorology. There is, uh, well, there is micrometeorology, which is very, very localized. There is uh, local meteorology. There's also mesoscale and other things like that. So it happens at different scales. Um, so so this, is your, this is where you're describing this region. And so you used to see uh, a lot of rain there, and now you don't anymore. Uh, if you look at this, so this uh, middle, a graph represents uh, this whole region, this whole region you're looking at here. So one thing that is clear is that um, because of the region-wide, uh, what's going on region-wide, there is a general decreasing trend of rainfall. But then within this general decreasing trend, there are some fluctuations, short-term fluctuation. Sometimes, the short-term fluctuation can last, uh, can be, can, can have a, another uh, embedded uh, cycle, uh, like in this case where there was this and then there was a decrease here, but within the decrease there's up and down. So it could be, what you're seeing could be uh, temporary or, um, you know, it could, be, it could be for the long haul. It could be that there will not be rain anymore there. We don't know that because of these kinds of things that happen. Okay, so there is this high frequency variation, there is this uh, lower frequency variation, and there is this long-term trend. So I don't know which one is happening in your region where you are. Okay. So now you ask, uh, what about the, um, uh, you know, uh, development uh, projects like uh, cutting down leveling hills in order to build? Um, it's the impact of that is minimal because most of the rainfall you get here does not come from here, it comes from the ocean. During the rainy season, the general uh, wind direction, it takes the water from the ocean and comes up here. So of course, it's very important for water to be still on the ground for to be enhanced, but 
most of the water comes from the ocean. So uh, what's happening in your region locally, even though it's very important to take care of your environment so that um, you know, it does not uh, adversely impact what's going on in the general environment, I don't think what's happening locally in your area because of development is affecting the rainfall, but it could be because when you remove the vegetation, there is no evapotranspiration from vegetation and evapotranspiration is what also contributes to the water that goes to the sky to form the clouds and to form the rain. So uh, on a small scale, probably not too much. On the larger scale, because what's going on here is also going on throughout this region. Oh, so, okay. but I don't think that development should stop because of uh, this, you know, development should be done carefully. So in many places, people, bu people build, uh, develop uh, real estate, and then they plant trees. So it's, it's important to do that. So as to kind of recover at least some of what you have lost during development. So you now ask about uh, water pollution. Um, I think it's, it's best not to pollute water. It's not good for health. And you know that, and I know that. Yeah, sure. um, but I do not think that at that small scale, it affects the rainfall. Even if you pollute the water, the water will still evaporate and uh, contribute to uh, cloud formation and rain. Uh, but at the local scale you're describing, um, I don't think it's, it's a very significant factor. All right. But Thank you of course, it's good to keep it clean. That's sure. all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Dr. Choku, thank you so much for your time. I see, um, yeah. George, if you have one quick... I have a quick comment. Yeah. Uh, thanks for an excellent talk. It was very informative. Uh, the, the one thing I want to comment on, that the models are quite unreliable for predictions on timescales of decades and longer. And uh, up to 6,000 years ago, the Sahara had lakes, not just Chad, lots of lakes. And uh, it was possible to cross the Sahara by horseback. And then it's, it's because of astronomical factors, things related to the ice ages, it became dry. However, it's quite possible that with global warming, Africa will actually benefit. And it's possible that the lakes may come back to the Sahara. It's, it's a complicated story, but you have to look at the paleoclimates as to what caused the Sahara to have lakes in the past. And so I'm hoping some of the, some future of one of these workshops, there will be a discussion of the paleoclimates. All right, thank you. That's a very, very important point that you've raised there. Um, it is true that it's possible for the changing climate to continue in such a way that, you know, um, water, you know, the Sahara may be hydrated in the, in the distant future. Yeah, that's a possibility, but we don't, wait, we don't want to wait until then to have water. So, but, so, but so we need water now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's a very good comment there. Thank you. And thanks for adding that. And we just, we want to be respectful of your time and we're hitting right at that 15 minute mark. And so I just want to say that we appreciate you, Dr. Choku, and we just value this time with you and being able to hear more about your work. So thank you for being there. I think we can all kind of clap from wherever we are um, and cheer you on for just giving us this today. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you all for joining.